Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 22. Vacation time! We are out in the tropics on an island on vacation that we've been planning for months and months, and it's awesome, particularly since Boston is basically a frozen wasteland right now. Yes. So I'm glad to be away. It's both buried in snow and probably negative degrees right now. Yep. As you can probably hear, with me today is Orion. Hello. And we've got Amber, who's prepping dinner, but may be around at some point. And then Logan, Orion's friend, who is also with us on vacation, may stop in, although it looks like he's watching a movie instead. Who knows? It's all kinds of surprises on today's episode. It's all kinds of relaxing. We're on vacation. Yeah, you can probably maybe hear the sound of the ocean behind us. It sounds really nice. If you can't hear it, it, it it's, it's awesome. If you can't hear it, you should come here so that you can hear it. There you go. Yes, highly recommend vacationing in the Caribbean. We got three games to talk about that we have been playing here on vacation. Uh, Harvest, Hunt for the Ring, and Spirit Island. I think I want to go over them in that order. Mm -hmm. Let's start with Harvest. I just posted my review of Harvest. I think it is a delightful little worker placement game. It takes the kind of Euro worker placement decisions and puts them into a 30 to 40 minute game and is just a solid piece of work. Like, there's nothing extraordinary about it other than that it just does what it does very well. At least that's how I see it. Yeah, my kind of one liner on this was nothing especially outstanding but a solid Euro game. Yeah, it's solid. And, and when you play, I mean, we played a lot of good games this year, but we played a good number of mediocre games, especially ones I've gotten from review copies, that, which have been a little bit hit and miss. And this was a review copy, and I didn't know anything about it before I got it from TMG. And I'm looking at the box, and it has this kind of fantasy creatures on it, and it says Harvest. And then I go look inside, and it's, oh, it's a worker placement game about farming. I've never seen one of those before. <laughs> cough, cough, <laughs> Agricola. Yeah, exactly. And then we played it, and... Uh, it really surprised me, like, just solid from front to back with interesting decisions, and it doesn't take that long. And it's hard to find games in that 30 to 45 minute time range that actually provide a good amount of thought. The only other one we have, I think, on our shelves right now would be Roll for the Galaxy. In terms of multiplayer games, not sure. just two-player games, I can't think of any others that are kind of 30 to 45 minute Euros that have a good amount of thought. Like, we we talked about Downforce that I've recommended wholeheartedly this year. That's in that time range. But it's a much lighter game. It's more like a party game. Mm-hmm. You don't see that, at least I haven't seen that a lot with, with Euro games, so it was a really nice surprise. Yeah, I the first time we played this, I was kind of like, eh, I don't know about this game. It looks kind of boring, farming, short, I don't know. But we played it, and... It, I think it can be bland at times, I'd say, but overall it's it's fun, and I think the fun-to-time ratio is solidly in its favor uh, for the like the amount of game and the decisions you have and the, the strategies and stuff. There's enough variety in the actions and the characters to, to keep it interesting, and uh, it's only you know 40 minutes, so I think it's, it's very solid for what it is. I wouldn't even say it's bland at times. Like To me, because it's such a short game where you have 10 main actions... For the mm-hmm. whole game, either you have two workers for your worker placement, and there are five rounds in every game. Given that, I think it moves away from the kind of blandness it could have simply because you have to be thinking about the end game from the very beginning. It's not really an engine builder, although there are some engines you can build on a very limited scale. Yeah, you build up your farm and get a couple upgrades, but again, you only have ten actions, so yeah, you can only, do maybe like two of those. <laughs> yeah, you're only getting a couple of upgrades. You're trying to synchronize that with your character's ability, right? which there are a variety of characters to choose from that have fairly significant abilities. Like the one I played yesterday was able to add a third worker at the end of each round, so I got 50% more actions. And all, almost all of the different characters have that kind of significance to their special abilities to to boost them. Yeah, and we've only played it a handful of times, but I haven't found one that is inordinately overpowered. I think most of our games have been fairly close. Yeah, and they're interesting, too. They provide Mm -hmm. really fascinating twists on the game that I think keep it fresh. Because at least for the first, you know, 
10 or 5 to 10 plays, I think you're just going to be trying to figure out how to utilize your character the best. So in that sense, it has a long shelf life in terms of just getting basic competency because you have to rethink everything every time you get a new character you haven't encountered before. Try to say, okay, how do I make this ability work for me? Yeah, I think as you play it more, you get a sense of about what you can do in the time Mm -hmm. and kind of a couple, you get through a couple cycles of planting, tending, harvesting, gathering resources to build up your points. I think our winning scores have been around 50, mid 50s. Mid mid to high 50s, I think. Yeah, 50 to 60, somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, But the characters will make one aspect of it significantly more efficient. Right. So they might, you know, sometimes you can plant for free. Or the one I played most recently, there's a, there's kind of a cycle of plant, tend, which you spend water to duplicate your crops in the field. And then there's harvesting, and there's also expanding your farm, plowing to expand your usable fields. Mm-hmm. And this character had all of those four actions were interchangeable. So it suddenly makes a lot of your actions more flexible so that the choose two of those becomes choose any of them. And certain times when some of the special actions get you, let you do something you might otherwise not be able to. So those sorts of decisions make it, it fun. That, I played that character in the game before, I think, and it was really interesting because with the initiative system, which I think is very clever... Yeah, for sure. You basically have a pre-round initiative pool where there are three cards in front of you and you can swap your... The, the initiative card you had earlier for a new one, and you get the bonuses on whatever new one you take. And the right. later you go in turn order, the better those bonuses are. So with that character, I was I realized pretty early on when I was playing her that I could take I could be a lot more free with getting a later initiative because I have more action flexibility mm-hmm. on other cards, which allows you to just generate more resources. And then like the character I played last, you know, I get that that bonus action. So I I really focused on. I'm trying to do a more than usual uh, harvesting cycles because those are kind of the main things you can do with basic actions, um, and I, which I know I'd get more of. There's all kinds of decisions like that, and it, I think it all ties together really well. You have the cool initiative system. You got the fact that the money in the game to do kind of advanced things like building buildings are harvested crops, so you kind of have to harvest crops before you can pay for things. Yeah. Later in the game. Which are your victory points as which well. Which are so also your victory you're points. You're spending victory points now to get a more powerful action or a super potion to hopefully give yourself more in the future, but you got to balance them because, again, you only have so many actions. Yeah. It, really, when you look at it, it's kind of a Euro game that just cuts out the middle of a typical game of this style. You have the beginning where you're trying to get a little bit of a leg up in momentum, and you have the end game where you're trying to cash in points. And this game kind of takes those two aspects of the worker placement game and smashes them together and eliminates the middle area where you're trying to like build up a big engine. And you kind of repeat the cycle a and couple you repeat times. It. Yeah, this one, you just try to get a little leg up and you try to cash in your points as fast as possible and then the game's over. Yeah, you kind of play the first like two turns of a worker placement and the last two turns, and then you have one in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I really enjoy it. I think the art's really cool. I love that it's in a small box. It's in like a code name size box. Yep. So it's a game with some meat that you can actually carry places and just overall very pleasant and solid. There's just a solid game that doesn't have any missteps really. Mm-hmm. Plus the currency for planting your crops is poop and they have a little poop, uh, yeah, yeah. pieces, which look like the poop emoji, which is just, you know, kind of fun. Who doesn't want that? I mean, yeah. Why, sure. Right? <laughs> Let's move over to Hunt for the Ring now, which we j- literally just finished playing for the first time. Yeah. 20 I minutes was, ago or something. Yeah, I was the ring bearer, the ring bearers. Well, first of all, it's a, uh, it's a hidden movement game. Right. One player will take the role of the Fellowship, trying to guide Frodo from... Not quite the Fellowship yet. Okay. It's gui- pre- gui- pre-Rivendell. It's pre-Fellowship. Guiding Frodo and his companions, the other hobbits... Uh, made possibly Strider later on, uh, mm-hmm. from somewhere in Hobbiton to Rivendell. And you played in two parts. First, you have to get to Bree, and then there's a part two where the game changes. You flip the map, and then you're going from Bree to Rivendell. Right. Everyone else will play Nazgul, who are hunting the hunting Frodo, 
similar uh, to something like uh, Fury of Dracula. Right. Yeah, same kind of principle. And actually a lot of similarities to Fury of Dracula. But doesn't Fury of Dracula also have the same turn structure of two days and one night? Or is it just one day, one night? It's one day, one night. Okay. This one gives you two day phases in each day. But somewhat of a similar turn structure there. The, the difference is Fear of Dracula, the hunters get a day phase and then a night phase, and then Dracula goes. Oh, I, that's right. I think, right. If, I, if I remember correctly, that's how That it makes works. sense, yeah. But I haven't then played that one in a while. Yeah, but their night is restricted, and they can't really move at night and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And this removed some of that, and it kind of changed some of the limitations, and I think mostly for the better. Right. Uh, and, and really, that's going to be, I think, the main comparison. Well, I haven't played a lot of the hidden movement games. I like the genre in theory. I, I heard Fury of Dracula was the best one, so that's the one we purchased a while ago. And I had a pretty good time with it. I think some parts were really fun. My big beef with Fury of Dracula is that the beginning game is just so dull. Because you just your best strategy is just standing in one place and grabbing as many cards as possible. Right. And then after, like, turn four or five, around four or five, then you actually start hunting for Dracula. But I think this one is a bit quicker to get you in the action. And it's designed so that you get caught multiple times. Even if you're going to win the game, I think you're not going to get by unscathed. Yeah, that was a really interesting thing that I that I thought about, I don't know, halfway through the game, is that as Frodo, you just have to accept that you're going to take some corruption damage and you're going to get caught a couple of times. Right. And you have to kind of be have a robust enough strategy to shake that off. And the game has mechanics so that when you get caught, you get a boost of movement to get away somewhere. Right. So you get... Essentially, if when you get caught, you're going to leave the Nazgul players with like three to four options typically, of where you're going to escape to. Mm -hmm. So there's you get some leeway, but not a lot. What I found the, the most interesting, I think, in this game, compared to Furio Dracula and what I think other hidden movement games do, is that as the ring bearer, you're really pushed to just make a beeline towards your exit. And so you get, like, one juke, basically, one tricky move, and then you just have to sprint towards the end. Right, because your time lim is very limited. Right, like, in, in the first half, you have 16 moves to get to Bree, and I think the most direct route was 12 or 13 moves. Somewhere around there. So, you have very little leeway, and you want to leave a little bit of space for if the Nazgul catch you in that first part, you do get a little bit extra movement if they catch you, because you get a couple extra pits. A little bit. But yeah. then if you're, they're catching you a lot, then you're behind anyway. So yeah. I guess in that sense, it's an interesting kind of catch-up catch up mechanism, where if you get cornered early and caught, you can try to slip away and get a little bit of momentum back. It really just helps you jump to the next location. Because the way the map is set up is you have numbered locations, which are kind of like settlements or towns, small towns. Mm -hmm. And then you have wilderness locations, which are little pips in between those. And you've got paths all over the place. And then a couple roads, a couple main roads leading, you know, through Hobbiton that eventually get to Bree. And uh, the most direct route is just to, you know, beeline down the road. But the Nazgul can move three times as fast as you on the road and will find you. Right. So I think the strategy is spend some time on the road or on a very direct route. Especially in the middle on that first map, there's... There's like a, 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 a river that really screws up some of the, the way the directions work there, where you're kind of funneled into one spot. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's interesting to see kind of how the, the map connections and how they, they have some underlying terrain painted on the map, and you're like, oh, there's a ridge here, and you can't really cross. All right, I, I yeah. can kind of see that. Or here's obviously the river ford, and all the paths kind of converge there. Right. Well, and also I have to mention the map is just beautiful. Oh, yeah, for sure. Very like War of the Ring, which is made by the same company, Ares, and the same designers, uh, whose names I don't remember, but they're Italian. It's very Lord of the Rings-ish, like it just oozes Lord of the Rings feeling with the greens and the browns and the yellows. And I, I love the art design they've done with, with these two games, this one and, and, and War of the Ring, pulled from the original book illustrations, I believe, and not the movies, which... It's great. I think those original book illustrations are, are just wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
The other interesting thing, let, well, let's stick to the first half of the game, because that's the more traditional hidden movement part. What I found interesting is that there's another little kind of mini game going on where the Nazgul are able to basically gain passive powers if they find locations that are important to the hobbits. And so what happens is there are a certain number of named locations on the board, like... You know, well, Weathertop and Weather the old top, burrows yeah. and, I don't know, n- named locations from the books, things like Various that. Various places, you know, where hobbits live. And at the beginning of the game, the ring bearer player draws four tokens that will have, or excuse me, five tokens that will have five of those locations listed, their numbers listed. They choose one and give it to the ring rate players, and that unlocks their first ability, which gives them they can spend a die for an extra movement. Yep. The other four locations are open, and one of the actions the ring rates can do is search a location when they're on it. And so if they search one of these named location and locations and it matches one of the four that the ring bearer has behind their screen, then it's revealed and the Nazgul gain another ability. Right, and the abilities tend to be spend a dice to move farther or... S- convert them or do something, you know. It gives you more flexibility with your dice. Yeah. And then the ring bearer, if they go to that location in secret, uh, as they're traveling, they can just flip it over and it's no longer available to the to the Nazgul. What did you think of that mini games? I found it very interesting. It's a little kind of a little twist on things. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I think it can sometimes be a distraction for the Nazguls or for the or for either side really of I think it's definitely possible to overvalue that. The, the powers gave you additional flexibility, but they certainly weren't critical to uh, to winning. Although I will say, the if you manage to get all five, starting the second half with the Lord of the Nazgul would, I think, be a really big boom. Yeah, if you happen to get all five, which I think would be very difficult to do. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're as the ring bearer, you're going to draw one that's pretty close to your starting point, I think, yeah. most of the time. Probably. So you can just you, you'd have to be it. unlucky with the draw, and it, it would be a variance sort of situation. Yeah, but then they get to start with the Lord of the Nazgul, which is a super powerful character. Adds uh, an extra action die. Yeah, and uh, hunts twice as well, and all his actions are bad. It is just stronger. just better. Just better. And he starts with that in the second half. So the game isn't so much a kind of cat and mouse. It's there's obviously some cat and mouse stuff, but like I said. Your path has to be like one good juke and then sprint. It's like if you if you take the football analogy, it's the downhill running back. One cut and go. One cut and go. Yeah. Uh, what is it, Denver that does that famously? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Uh, rather than the kind of, you know, the Le'Veon Bell kind of running back who's like the moving patient, back waiting, and forth, waiting, patient, waiting, waiting, yeah. waiting, that kind of thing. Because you just don't have time. Because you literally don't have time. If you backtrack or if you move too far laterally instead of horizontally towards your goal, you're just not going to have enough spaces. And in the first... And, and the punishment for not making it is fairly severe. It's quite severe. And in the first half game that we played when we realized... Before we realized we started it very wrong and gave the ring bearer a horrible disadvantage, I was at a point where I literally had one path I could take and get there in the end. And it... I just had no more choice because I, I dallied around too much. Mm-hmm. And so that was a little bit surprising. I think it works thematically because the Hobbits are really at a sprint to Bree in the books. right? They're really trying to get there. Or at least, I, it's been a while since I've read the books. In the movie, it's kind of like that. They're just trying to get there as They're fast pretty as terrified possible. and just they're trying scared. to get to yeah. safety. Yeah. yeah, they're trying to get to safety. It's a big world. They haven't explored it uh, you know, a lot. And so they're not going to lounge around in the woods. So I think it works thematically. I kind of wish, just based on one play, there was a little bit more flexibility in being sneaky. But I understand why they did what they did. Yeah, my half critique would be the Fellowship side felt a bit more railroaded than Dracula in that you pretty much just had to, you had to pick one path and just kind of go for it. Whereas in Fury of Dracula, you're really winding all over the place and trying to juke the hunter's... And that's almost the whole game. Whereas right. this, it's really get to Bree to unlock the second half. And I think they do that for two reasons. I think 
One is that it's more thematic, and it, and it holds with the kind of design philosophy we saw in War of the Ring also, where they, it seems like they made decisions to try to keep the game a little bit more faithful to the books at the expense of mechanical elegance. Sure. Um, and I think they probably had that thought here. And I think they did it just to, to hurry the game along a bit. Because even then, it was a fairly long game to get through. We spent, what, probably three hours? Two to three hours? Yeah, but you had to explain it, and we had a false start, so... Yeah, I think there's some variation, but it's very strategic. It's less tactical than Fury of Dracula, where you can completely change your plans halfway through. Mm -hmm. Or they do something and find out some information you have to change a lot. In this one, it's in the first half, it's just a mad rush to get to the end. Yeah. And I think that's fine. I think it, it, it... it creates a less variable play, uh, or a less variable game, where at some point they're going to find you, and it's whether or not they find you halfway across or like two thirds across the map, mm-hmm. and how often they find and, you, and how frequently, yeah, how, how yeah. quickly you're able to get away. It's got the same thing as War of the Ring in that you have specific characters that can do things for you. Mm-hmm. As in War of the Ring, the the win condition for the the Seron side, the, the Nazgul side, is to corrupt Frodo, and that's by essentially attacking him and scaring him, finding out where he is and attacking him. Mm-hmm. But you can essentially sacrifice your companions to reduce the pain of that. Right. And Even though wouldn't that hurt Frodo more, like to see Sam die to a Nazgul yeah, or something? Maybe. Who knows? I don't know. Or just makes him more scared. All right. I guess he escapes the trap and maybe is less corrupted, but... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Let's not think about it too hard. <laughs> uh, but as you sacrifice those c- companions, you lose passive powers, which which was really interesting. Yeah. One thing I didn't know when I sacrificed Frodo at one point, or when I used his one-time use ability, mm-hmm. which I needed to do anyway because it was my last sprint into the, the final location, is that I lost the fellowship token going into turn two from uh. the pool. So I only had two to work with. And that's another thing. You have these fellowship tokens that... Are basically a currency and also a balancing thing because if the shadow player rolls wild sides on their dice to do things, you get more fellowship tokens in play. Those can allow you to draw more action cards and allow you to use kind of like really powerful effects from those cards. Yeah, I used them a couple times to block damage or cancel our attacks or hunts yeah. or things like that. Yeah, so both sides have these hands of action cards. They don't seem quite as interesting as in War of the Ring. You play less of them. You play fewer of them, yeah. And I guess they're not quite as conditional as in War of the Ring. Mine mine didn't seem to be. I I drew several that said the Nazgul have to be connected to a a, a, a location on the trail, a track token, or in a a dark site. Oh, okay. Um, We had several like that. Uh, Some were more conditional. Some were at nighttime. So I would say the Nazgul ones were probably more conditional. Yours Mine were, were probably more, more reactive or general use. Yeah, yeah. But they were they were implemented fairly well, I think. Mm. They got me out of a few big-time binds. Yeah, they saved you from some jams. Yeah, and they allowed me to misdirect. So, if, mm-hmm. you know, a couple times I played a card that canceled a search, even though the search would have kind of come up with nothing, just because I wanted to try to put some doubt in your guys' minds. Right. Which I think worked fairly well. Yeah, because we were eliminating possibilities... And you were able to misdirect us some, which is something the Fellowship player will definitely need to do. Yeah. And then once you finish the first half of the game, so once you get to Bree, assuming you get to Bree, which honestly you should. The game is balanced so that you will. You pro- you almost You'd have to will. play very poorly and have bad luck to not. Yeah. Uh, you flip the board over, you get a whole new sheet of paper to draw your secret actions on, and then you essentially play as Gandalf in the second half from Bree to Rivendell. And I think the second half is a little bit less successful, at least for the the ring bearer player. There's less you can do because the ring bearer, Frodo, essentially is given a set track to follow. So there's a deck of cards that you draw from and you choose from that say, okay, you're going on this specific path. And so every time you move, you just advance the marker that says how many spaces you've moved. You look at where that is on the card, and that's where you are. Instead, you're moving Gandalf, who has a couple of abilities, 
I think it's a little bit more tricky to utilize him effectively. So one of the things you can do is use Gandalf to find three randomly selected spaces, again, name spaces on the map. Similar to the Nazgul power-ups in the first half, right. Gandalf can find these random named locations in the second half. And then when he finds them, it increases how much corruption Frodo can take before losing the game. That's a little bit of a bonus, and it gives some uh, incentive for Gandalf to sprint across the map. He can also eliminate, go to a spot where a Nazgul is, or more than one Nazgul, and eliminate a Fellowship token from the game, and then essentially appear out of nowhere and, and hoard them back, so you can move them away from that spot. And then for that turn, it blocks them from uh, moving through or onto his location. So you could do that as a diversion tactic to say to pretend that Frodo is there or nearby, or you can use it as a last-ditch effort to actually keep them away from Frodo just a little bit longer so he can escape a bit more. Mm -hmm. But the, the other part of it is that the, the uh, Nazgul can do these kind of perception checks to check a whole region, and Gandalf can be a false positive when searching for the Fellowship you know? Yeah, yeah. I, you guys didn't do a lot of those. You, you weren't rolling the right dice for those, it seems. We rolled a lot of hunt dice in the yeah. second half. Uh, so I wasn't able to use that quite as effectively. But there didn't seem quite as much like quite as much to do as Gandalf. Or it might be that I was just playing him pretty poorly. But I, think I thought it was still interesting, but not quite as strong as the first half. That's probably true. I think there's... A bit of an art to playing Gandalf that you would kind of discover with another player yeah. too. Yeah. And then if we played it a bunch, we'd kind of develop a meta where we expect certain things and then you buck that trend to misdirect and, and so on. Right. Yeah. So overall, I think it was a fun game. I think I, you, after one play at least, I prefer it to Fury of Dracula. I think it's a good game. It's not mind blowing, but I think it's solidly better than that game. Yeah, I will say on the Nazgul side, I think I enjoyed that more than the Hunters in Fury of Dracula uh, for a couple reasons. One was you can resolve your your different pieces in any order instead of the fixed initiative order in Dracula because the Hunters, you know, I forget his, the names, but, you know, the one guy always goes first and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Which really restricts how you can combine your abilities and things like that, which was... I've, I've run into that being annoying a couple times. Uh, and then secondly, I liked the flow of moving and taking one action rather than getting a daytime action and a nighttime action as the hunters. It just oh it yeah. just flowed a lot better and you could it just it just worked better. Yeah, that was so annoying in Fury of Dracula where your turns are just so short. Yeah. And you're just bouncing back and forth really quickly. In this one you have to do more on your turn. Right. And I liked the day night the differences there of uh, during the day, the Nazgul can move one space and take an action. During the night, they can move two spaces and take an action. Right. Because they're a little bit scarier, a little bit faster at night. Um, and then and if Frodo decides to, to move at night, it makes the Nazgul's well, night phase better. Well, first of all, he has to take a corruption. Right. And then the Nazgul get to get a more powerful search yeah. uh, for free instead of having to spend a dice for it. Which honestly was a genuinely interesting decision. And I yeah. went back and forth on quite a bit. Yeah, you used both options sometimes. Yeah, I probably went 50-50 on that. Mm -hmm. But it, it created that kind of situation where it's like, well, I know I'm in a spot where they can't hunt me. But if I move, does that reveal that I'm in a spot where they can't hunt me? Or am I overthinking this? Or do you need the corruption relief from resting? Or yeah, something? yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was interesting. And I got the impression there was a lot more balance in the interest of of, of how interesting it is to play both sides. I feel like in Fury of Dracula, it's a lot more interesting to be Dracula compared to being a hunter. In this one, it seemed more balanced. Like, I, you guys seem to be I, having a lot of I fun. I enjoyed playing the Nazgul a lot more than I enjoyed playing the hunters in Dracula. Yeah. And I felt, you know, the second half was seemed a little bit weak, but I was probably just paint, playing poorly. And I had a, a good time you know, trying to sneak around you. It was, you know, it was, it was what you would expect from a, a hidden movement game where at some points where you were closing on, in on me or you had narrowed it down to just a couple locations and it's like, please don't pick the location I'm on. I just need one more turn to move out of the way. You know, that kind of tension. It does suffer from 
I think, something that's necessarily part of the genre, which is that eventually in any hidden movement game, you're going to know exactly the odds. And in this one, that happens quite a bit, where it's like, okay, he can literally only be in one of these three locations. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe we can check out two of them. And then the game boils down to that kind of very basic pick-a-card kind of thing. I don't yeah. think you can get around that in the genre, and it doesn't bother me too much. It didn't bother me in this game as much, because, I don't know, I felt I was kind of leading the Nazgul side, and was able. we were coordinating our efforts, and we were able to be pretty strategic and cutting out possibilities of like, all right, he, we know how far you've gone, you're not here, you're not here, so you probably went in this direction, and you're probably in one of these locations, So, and we had different tools of finding you, so we could do the broad check a region, or we could search an area, or we could actively spend a dice and hunt for you and try to do damage if we were, you know, confident that you were there. Yeah. Well, actually, that's an interesting mitigating factor I didn't play into enough, is that to actually hunt, which is the only way you can capture, not capture, but you can, you can actually find out where Frodo precisely is, you have to spend a certain die to do that. Yeah, and so we didn't talk about this before, but at the end, at the beginning of each round, the Nazgul players roll six dice, and they give, like in War of the Ring, they give you options for things to do with those dice. So right, and the Nazgul still have their basic move and search, which just checks the location: is this in Frodo's history? Yeah, is it part of the path? Is it part of the path? Um, but then they can, instead of doing the basic search, they can spend a die to do a more powerful action. They can either hunt, which is a search plus attack if you find Frodo. They can do the perception, which is check a whole region. There's the uh, the sorcery, which is draw or play a card. The, the wild, I think. Wild one, yeah. Yeah. So that creates an interesting limitation to where if they roll poorly, they may know where Frodo is, but not be able to do much about it. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. The other aspect of the game we haven't talked about yet is the ally tokens, which didn't play into much. I think they were a slight nuisance maybe once in the game. But effectively, there are cards on the ring bearer side that allow you to place ally tokens on the board. And they represent, you know, various hobbits and such. Who friendly parties. Friendly or, people. Yeah. To, to, to the hobbits. Sometimes you can move them around, and essentially they block the Nazgul from moving on to or through them. Right. Um, and the Nazgul can kill them, but it takes a die to do that. Yep. And, it, you know, diminishes their efficiency by a bit. I didn't get a lot of those cards, so I suspect maybe my draw was poor on ally cards. Because I think the most I ever had on the map at any one time is two, and the maximum is eight. So wow. they didn't okay. play into, into much. Yeah, if you had, like, six allies on the board, that could have really hampered our movement. Yeah, I could really use them strategically. So I wonder if it was just the luck of the draw, or you guys, you were pretty good at kind of killing them off as soon as they came out, too. Yeah, we made a point. If, if we thought they were going to block us, we made a point to take them out. Yeah. But uh, after one play, it gave a, a good first impression for me. Yeah, I, it was a fun game. I like it. Uh, you know, not mind-blowing, but really fun game. And the best I've played, at least, in the hidden movement genre... Although it might only be the second one I've played. <laughs> Other right. than Fury, Fury of Dracula. I like it more than Fury of Dracula, which is a solid game, but I like this one better. So, yeah, yeah. after one play, we'll see how it ages. Yeah, we'll have to do a, uh, a Lord of the Rings extravaganza at some point, play this, and then lead it into War of the Ring, yeah. and do the entire saga. Right, while watching the extended edition or something. It'll be perfect. <laughs> The last game I wanted to talk about is Spirit Island, which I am completely enthused with. I it, think this has got to be the highlight, uh, not only because it's a fun game, but also because we are on a tropical island right now. There you go. Yeah, it was very, very, what's the word I'm thinking of? Thematic? Fitting? Fitting. There we go. It was very fitting uh, to be playing Spirit Island on an island. But Spirit Island is about... Players playing spirits on this island where there are colonialists coming in and trying to take it over, and the spirits are trying to defend the island against the uh, insurgents. Is that the right word? Insurgents? The invaders? Invaders. Invaders would be better. I think that is the term they use. Oh, is it? Yeah. And it's a heavy Euro, I would say solidly heavy Euro. Co-op game. Co-op game, which we don't see a lot of, which is... 
really interesting. It's beautiful to look at, all kinds of bright colors, just wonderful to look at, nice wooden pieces, nice plastic pieces, bright and colorful. The different spirits and their abilities and cards are so diverse and interesting and the game is just a lot of fun. There's so it's so deep and so much to dive into that you know we played what three or four times and I don't think I've even scratched the surface of like what strategy would look like in this game. Yeah, a, a huge point that we've we've <laughs> barely delved into is that it has an, a, a really uh, scalable difficulty system, mm-hmm. so you can really ratchet up the difficulty if you want a hard game. I think we played on difficulty zero or one the first time and had kind of a close encounter and got through it just kind of gritting it out. And, uh, and, and like on the last turn we could have won, I think we, we pulled it out. Yeah. And then we played again and just crushed it. And we're like, all right, well, let's ratchet it up to three. And we just got like sma- slapped down. And yeah, and difficulty goes bad. up to ten. Yeah. Like, I don't know how we were going to beat difficulty three. Right, which I think that leads into my next thing is that we, we kind of both noticed on that on that game where we lost on the harder difficulty, all of our spirits kind of felt slow to build up, and we needed like four or five rounds before we could really get going, but by that time we were so far behind in controlling the, the invaders on the island that we just, we had no shot. Yeah. So I think there eventually there will be some very interesting strategy, not only in utilizing your powers, but also in choosing a team to combat a certain scenario if you you know if you get to that point in playing it exactly repeatedly. yeah i love games that do that where you play them and they're interesting the first time and they're fascinating but you know that there's so much more to learn about the game and to learn about strategy and that's how spirit island is one of the things that was interesting i was reading in the back of the rule book on the designer's note and he said one of his goals when making this game was to eliminate the quarterbacking problem in co-op games. And we've talked about this before on the podcast about how we think the most effective way to do that or the most effective way that that's been done is with Space Alert, a real-time game. Because because there's such a time limitation, you just simply can't quarterback because there's too much information to to soak in 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 a limited amount of time. I think Spirit Island does kind of defeat the quarterbacking issue just because not even in a real-time system, but just generally, there's too much information for one person to keep track of. Like, yeah. you have to rely on other people to play their character well. Right, and every character is unique, has their own set of abilities and cards, and then the way their energy and play and card playing... I don't know, they all just play differently. So yeah. you, you have to know how your race works, and until you've played it a dozen times, you're not going to know how to play every race. So yeah. you kind of have to, like... That person has to figure it out. I think some people would could still quarterback in this because you could just sit there for hours and debate and debate and have one person say, No, this is the way to do it. But it's just it's not as fun. So you just you keep playing the game and someone says like, Oh, I need to do this, how do we handle this? And then you know, Mark says, together to figure Oh, out. I have an ability that can destroy that town and push the others out of the way but I need elements to do it. And then I'm like, oh, I have this card that can give you elements to upgrade your powers, but then I can't play this other one, so I need help on this region. And so, I don't know, it's just, it's a fantastic game. You have to work together to solve the puzzle. The difficulty goes as high as you want it. Um, Unique play styles of the different races, it's it's got it all. Well, let's talk about the pacing of the game a bit, because I think it's it's really interesting. Because... In any co-op game, you need some element of randomness to surprise you that you're playing against. So, you know, in Space Alert, it's the ships that come up. In Pandemic, pandemic, it's the way the cards are drawn from the Epidemic deck. Uh, in, In Forbidden Desert, it's the way the sands are moving. The sandstorm is moving. In this one, it's on what territory types the invaders come on. So there's kind of a track at the bottom of the player board where you have cards that show different territory types, and there are four in the game. Terrain types. Terrain types, sorry. And the first one will be, from left to right, that resolve are ravaging, which means if there are enemies there, they'll ravage the land, which can drop light, which is one of their loss conditions. And they attack the natives. They attack the natives. 
if they drop blight, they you have to remove one of your presence tokens from the board. Moving to the right again, one more, you they build an area, so if they have any presence there whatsoever, they build towns and cities in those areas. And then the furthest one right is Explore, where they actually bring in uh, colonists, build people, who kind of dot the map and start the process of building. Now that resolves left to right, but the cards shift from right to left. So you have a certain terrain type that's exploring, and then the next round that terrain type builds. So unless you do something about it, they're all going to build because they just all got an exploration colonist. And then if you don't do anything about that, the next time they're all going to ravage and they're all going to drop blight because now they've explored and built and they have enough attack power to drop blight. Right. So you have to, from the very beginning of the game, you have this problem where, oh no, this terrain type's going to get ravaged and we need to take care of this. But if you don't look ahead a little bit, you're just going to fall behind because they're building up, at least in the early game, they're going to be building up faster than you can take them apart. Mm -hmm. So you have to be selective about what you allow to fall behind and how you protect ahead in the early game until you can build up enough where you can kind of counter the entropy of the colonists. Because we found at a certain point in our successful games, we get to a point where we actually start making progress overall on the board. Mm -hmm. And that's just a wonderful narrative arc to the game. Where you yeah, you're like struggling, 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 and you get to the tipping point, and you're more powerful, but they're, they've destroyed so much of the island, and you only have a little bit left to protect, and you're trying to get it over the hill to and, and, and drive yeah. them out. It's it's just perfect. It's really subtle. Yeah. You know, sometimes we got to a point in one of our first games where we're like, wow, we have no idea how we're going to win, and then the very next round, we figured out a way to win the game. And that actually plays into some of the other ways in which... The game very, very smartly shapes the arc of the game. You have that dynamic there, but you also have fear, which is something that you're trying to generate. This is so cool. You're trying to generate fear as the spirits, and as you generate fear, you basically... There's a certain amount in the pool for the game, and as you generate fear, you shift it down into another part of the board. Once you get through the entire pool of fear, you flip over a fear card. And in the next round, whenever the fear phase happens, you reveal that card and it gives you a little bit of a bonus. So you might be able to move an enemy from, you know, maybe each player is able to move an enemy from one space to another. A little bit of a bonus. But the fear cards are interspersed with these other tokens. Like phases. Phases, basically, of the game. So as you generate more fear cards, not only do they give you little bonuses, but after you get through the first three, then all of a sudden the victory condition of the game is easier for you. Right. And then after you get through the second three, the victory condition becomes even easier. And then if you get through the final three, you just win the game. So you could have a strategy, and we haven't done it yet, where you just really try to ramp up as much fear as possible and win on fear, not just by taking out cities and towns. Right. Because the the basic victory condition is eliminate all invaders from the island. Every single plastic piece has to be gone. Which I don't think anyone's going to ever do. Which it's intended to be almost impossible. Right. Then the the next one is you only have to destroy the buildings, and then the third one is only the large buildings, the cities, and then finally, if you you manage to get all the way through the fear deck, you just instantly win. So you have that making the game easier. Also, as you get through those different stages, the fear cards themselves are more impactful. Right, so a fear card in Phase 2 has a more powerful effect than that same card if it was in Fear Card 1. So it has three kind of versions of itself. Right. But, at the same time, the cards that show the terrain type that are going to be impacted get worse. So the first couple are just in one terrain type, And then the second phase, it does one terrain type plus some other bonus bad thing that happens based on the scenario that you chose. And I think it has the coastal type, which is rough. And you can hit all coastal lands, which is really rough. And then in the the final phase, the last few rounds, it'll impact two different terrain types, which is just brutal. Yeah. So I think it's just awesome how the game gets a little bit easier on one hand as you do well but also gets harder as time passes. Yeah. 
And those two things play against each other and keeps the game interesting and changing and still challenging, but you feel like you're more powerful, even though it's still pretty challenging. When you get one of those really awesome fear effects, it feels great. You can really use that strategically in saying, all right, we can push like a, we can push a bunch of the invader pieces around. And we look at the next terrain types coming up and we're like, all right, well, we need to get everyone out of mountains so they don't build in the mountains. So maybe we can vacate four of the mountains on the map and then we can target and kill a couple others. And so nothing will build in the mountains this round, which just, it feels so good when you achieve oh, yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, and then it really sets you up for the next round and you're like, all right, We've taken care of mountains. Now we can push everything back into the mountains because that terrain type is gone and it's not coming up. And so that's a that's a safe area that we don't we don't have to worry about those. And now we can focus on say the wetlands. Right. Yeah. And those little bits of momentum, you feel the impact of them. Yeah. It's so interesting. Cool. I can't imagine designing this game must be crazy how they fine tuned all those little those different inputs to kind of keep it keep it a good tension in the game. Right. And, and really, like, it's a big game with a lot of depth and, you know, a good amount of complexity in line with something like Venus or, you know, the heavier Euro game. But in, in other instances, it, like in those, those kind of tensions pulling and pushing against the player, it's really precise and elegant in how it manages to do a lot of things with just some very simple cards flipped over. Yep. Just a, a really, really good game. One of my favorites of the year, for sure. Like, yeah, this, I know in, in the last podcast we went over my top five. This but, is an early entry for the top uh, first top new games of 2018, for sure. Yes, whenever I do the revised version of that list, the updated version, Spirit Island is definitely in my top to five 2017 games. You're going to count this as 2017 because we acquired it in 2017? It's a 2017 release. Oh, right. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt. No doubt it's up there. Uh, just a, a really beautiful game. And a game that I think has a ton of variety in that... There are different scenarios you play. Right. There are different invader countries which have their own unique abilities. And significant abilities. Significant like, abilities. Like we haven't even yeah. touched what they can do. Right. And then each of those... I think each of the scenarios has a difficulty rating that you can slide up and down? Not that you can slide up and down. They have inherent difficulty okay. ratings. Okay, okay. And then the invading country has their own levels. Is what zero through five or one through five? Uh, it's one through six. I one think. through six. Okay, so then you kind of add the difficulty rating of the scenario to the difficulty level of the country you choose to get your overall difficulty. And again, we've only tried three and got crushed. So yeah, there's well, plenty. And, and, plenty and to go it's there. not just like it makes yeah. the game more difficult, but it changes the emphasis. So like, yeah, one of the one of the invading countries is really fast. The one we lost brutally to is really good at building up infrastructure and cities. And and does a lot of damage to the it land. It does a lot the of damage to the land. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't even remember what the third one does, what their focus is. The scenarios are all very different. And like we said before, the different spirits you can play are so different. Like we've generally played with kind of a balanced setup. But I wonder what would happen if we played with, like, two heavy fear spirits and then, like, one to control the board. Could we do a game where we just have one person mainly just buying a bit of time while the other two are just trying to cycle as much fear as possible? I would love like, to try it. I That'd think be it's really viable. Cool. Yeah. And that's so exciting. Or do, could we do a setup where we don't really care about fear that much and we, like, build up super control on the board and just kind of trickle into that second tier and take out all the... All the cities and towns. Yeah. I think that's viable. And that's so exciting in a co-op game where you don't have those... You don't have a defined path to victory. You yeah. have multiple options and your spirits have different strengths. You can combine those to go for a different different victory condition. Yeah. And I've never seen that in a co-op before. Not in a co-op like this. Like in a, in a campaign game, maybe. Yeah. But, you know, kind of very pure for people against the game setup where it's basically the same game each time. I've never seen anything like that where there's that much variability and that much strategic variability that you can you can try out that seems viable. Yeah, I'm just running through, you know, other games we like, you know, Robinson Crusoe, Forbidden Desert, Space Alert, 
pandemic. Uh, those are kind of the other. Yeah, and there, but, I mean, like, there is a good strategy in pandemic you could do, in, but it's basically one idea. Th- there's, it's like there's, a, it's like a simple, not a simple, but there's like a heuristic you could follow to do well in pandemic. Sure. There's kind of a basic heuristic you can follow to do well in Forbidden Desert. You generally know the things you need to do. Yeah. And in Robinson Crusoe and Space Alert, you're mostly reacting to things. Yeah. Um, Robinson Crusoe is a lot more driven by the scenario, because that really changes that too, what yeah, you're trying to yeah. do. But this one, I think you can go into it and say, okay, we're going to try a fear strategy. You set up that way, and I think it would be just as enjoyable. Yeah. And I think it would work against certain scenarios and be horrible at... At others. Yes, yes. So the scenario cards actually do tell you, like, this scenario is a lot easier if you have this, if you're good at this kind oh, really? of thing. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. You've always set that up, parts up yeah. so I haven't seen it. But completely exciting game. I love the look of it. I love the theme. I love how much it makes my head hurt. Like, if you have AP issues, yeah, you this, can... is, this is not the game for you. Analysis paralysis to the extreme. Like, I got caught just mulling over options a few times and I that never happens to me because there's just so much to wrap your head around in yeah. a good way Be- and the other thing is it's so tight you really need to find a, like a top tier line of play right and just doing something will generally not not work out I think You'll, you just kind of fall behind and eventually lose yeah and it, it's the kind of like deep mechanical euro game thought process that you really only that I've only really seen before in competitive games. I've never seen it in a cooperative game. Like we love Gloomhaven, but this goes beyond Gloomhaven in terms of It's a different sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think in some ways Robinson Crusoe could could be similar, but all your individual actions are more complicated in this, whereas Robinson Crusoe it's more how do we allocate our actions. Right. Robinson Crusoe well, and there's a whole lot more luck in Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. There's an astonishingly little amount of luck in this game. Yeah, which the, is, the again, only rare random things is the order of the train types and the fear effects, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Those are the only... Well, I guess the power cards you draw oh, when right, you the acquire power cards. more cards. Yeah, yeah. But, but we, even then, they're really generous. You draw four and pick one. Yeah, and we, we've cycled through the whole deck every time, I think. So yeah. someone will have, a ha- will have had a cho- shot at every card. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really generous, and I think it works well. Because you want to try to gain cards that will synergize well with your strategy. The game wouldn't work if it was just like draw a random card off the top. Yeah, it would suffer. Suffer a lot. Because when, I, when I've when i gotten those those powers, I'll draw four of them, and two of them I pretty much can dismiss right. immediately, because I'm like, well, that doesn't work with my race, or those elements are wrong, or the effects don't work. And so then I'm usually choosing between two. Sometimes there's a clear one. Usually there's two that yeah. I'm considering. Well, that's something we haven't even talked about, is that on top of doing basic things to try to, you know, playing your basic cards to try to repel the invaders, you also have a kind of engine building thing going on with your individual spirit. It's like a mini deck builder kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, like but a little mini deck builder. More where like a hand builder. <laughs> at the beginning of each turn, you, you choose a growth option, which lets you expand your presence usually or gain a new card or recover your discard pile as you expand your presence you like in Terramisca, you take a token off your player board and put it onto the the main board and it opens up basically it makes your your spirit better so you get more energy which is your currency for playing cards or it can increase the number of cards you can play any given turn and almost all of the cards you play are targeted from your presence so it can expand your reach on the island. Right, that too. Interesting decision to make. It makes you get gradually more powerful. So not only are you able to get more powerful cards, you're able to afford to play them. You can play more cards, and you can affect more areas on the island. Yeah, so that part of the game is really fun, a little mini deck building part. And you have this whole element thing where each of the cards you play will basically unlock... Or, or it'll generate. generate a certain number of elements, usually like two to four yeah. out of the eight in the game. And you can spend those elements on innate powers that you have based on your spirit. Each spirit has a unique innate power or two, which does something with to go with their theme. So the river one can you know, push people around and do some damage. 
the fear races generally generate extra damage or things like that. Yeah, and the cool thing is that at the beginning of the game, you're not really ever going to be able to use one of your innate powers. So you have to get cards that generate the types of energy or the types of elements that you need for those powers. So sometimes when I'm gaining a card, it's a tough choice. Do I take this card that has a little bit better of an effect, or do I take this other card that has the elements that are going to sync up with my powers? Right. I've ran into that exact dilemma multiple times. Yeah, it's almost every time I get cards. And then sometimes you get a card that has a better ability if you have certain elements. So even in just the basic process of making your character better you have some really tough and interesting decisions there. Right, and trying to find a good synergy with choosing, you know, a card that you can play soon that will help you, with something that will give you the right elements for your innate powers, with just, you know, what you need at the time and how much energy you can afford, and it's it's, it's Really, great. really well made. I'm so glad I bought this game. I'm going to say it right now, the pre-revised top games of 2017 list, this is easily number two. Behind Gloomhaven? Behind Gloomhaven. I think I like Gloomhaven a little bit more, but I don't think by much. I think this game is is up there. It's really, really I th- good. I think I would probably put Gloomhaven ahead because I like the genre more. Yeah. Uh, and Gloomhaven is just, it's such a blast to play. I but think just this the is, scope of Gloomhaven is, is so exciting. Yeah. It's this so is, exciting. It, this is a great game, and I love it, and I look forward to playing it many more times. Yeah. This is, I mean... This is one of those games where at this point I'm thinking, like, whenever I make my top 50 or top 100 list again, this is in How consideration. How high can you push this? <laughs> like, is this top 10 already? <laughs> and that's the kind of thoughts I'm having. Really? Okay. So, I haven't released my review yet. I'll have a review of it at some point. But I'm telling you guys right now, if you are a fan of medium to heavy Euro games, you have to get Spirit Island. It's amazing. Well, I think that's our podcast for today. Amber did not join us, although she is over there cooking delicious chicken on the grill for us. So I don't blame her too much. I think we're going to go eat because I'm very hungry. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com for reviews and everything. Check out Twitter and Facebook. I'm there. I'm on Twitter a lot now. Check out the Patreon if you enjoy this podcast and want to listen to it live and be part of our awesome Discord channel, then pitch in a couple bucks a month on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. And don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Peace out.